Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Colvin, and I'm the Public Programs Curator at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I'd like to welcome you today to our virtual Food for Thought. Now, before we begin our program, I have a few announcements for you. First, I'd like to invite you to join us on Thursday, December 3rd at noon Central Time for a virtual panel titled History Now, the Montgomery Bus Boycott in Perspective. This panel will commemorate the 65th anniversary of the boycott and look to our social media and emails for more information. I'd also like to invite you to return virtually next month on Thursday, December 17th for our final Food for Thought of the Year as the Archives Director, Steve Murray, will present Alabama's archivist, Thomas M. Owen. Without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to today's speaker, Jim Knowles. Mr. Knowles is a 1990 graduate of West Point. He's a founding partner with the Birmingham law firm of Bars, Taylor, Knowles, Lowther, and writes as an independent historian. His most recent book is Undefeated, From Basketball to Battle, West Point's Perfect 1944 Season, which is available in our online store, Alabama Original. And we're gonna put a link in the comments for you so you'll be able to purchase it. Today, he'll present on Alabamians and, Alabama, and West Point's remarkable class of 1944. Jim, welcome. Thank you, Alex, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's a real honor to be speaking at the archives, although of course, I'm not in Montgomery with Alex. I'm here in my office in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm just speaking to my laptop, just the, the monitor here with the PowerPoint in front of me, which probably looks sort of crazy. So if at any moment my law partners start worrying about me and the door behind me opens and two guys in white suits come in and haul me off, I would just ask that somebody let Elizabeth know that I'll be, be late for dinner. But anyways, um, so here we are. I want to talk about West Point and in particular West Point uh, at the time of World War II and the entry of the class of 1944 into West Point. Um, and in spe specifically, a group of Alabamians that entered that class. Um, I went to, to West Point uh, from 1986 to 1990. I did not have this beard at the time. I mean, let's face it, it was West Point. It wasn't the Naval Academy. Um, but I gotta say, when you're there at West Point, and it is so easy to appreciate West Point's history. I mean, take a look at this slide here. This is a slide from the early 1900s, a photo from the early 1900s. And it shows you West Point. And as you look at it, they're occupying this strategic bluff overlooking New York's Hudson River. You can appreciate how it would have been a, such a strategic location um, at the time of the American Revolution. And in fact, this was the revolutionary fortress that Benedict Arnold tried to betray to the British. And even now, uh, along the bluff line looking north, there's a location called Trophy Point. And at Trophy Point, you have the cannons from the previous wars and memorials and statutes all commemorating you know, the some 200 years of wars that West Point's graduates have fought. And I guess that's one of the reasons why it's easy to appreciate West Point's history while you're there. Um, you know, let, let's think about it. You wear the same uniform that so many of those past graduates wore. You marched like they did on the same parade field. We called it the plane. You walk past statues of former graduates like Patton and Grant, and you pass by quarters uh, the the uh, the home uh, that once housed Robert E. Lee when he was the superintendent there. You live in barracks with names like Sherman and Pershing and Eisenhower and MacArthur uh, and now Benjamin Davis. So no wonder there's this pet saying of the history department at West Point that, quote, the history we teach was made by the people we taught. But West Point is more than West Point's history. And it's really, it's America's history. And since West Point draws its cadets from every state in the union, from Alabama to Wyoming, 
it's really, I think, fair to say that West Point's history is every state's history as well, which is why it's appropriate today, and I thank you again, Alex, for having me, to be here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History talking about West Point, and in particular, its historic, its remarkable class of 1944, and a few of the cadets from that class who first called Alabama home. Now, other than the class of 1990, my favorite class has always been the class of 1944, and that's ever been, been the case since I was able to learn more about that case, uh, that class, that class when I was writing my book about that year's undefeated basketball team from 1944. So let me tell you a little bit just generally about that class. Originally, it numbered some 600 uh, men, and they reported for duty at West Point on what was called our day on July 1st, 1941. Coming in, they'd cut the deal with the United States. They were to get four years of education at West Point. And at the end of that, they would be commissioned as second lieutenants into the Army and owe a five-year tour of duty or whatever, really, uh, the United States determined uh, was necessary at that point. And again, they were entering on, let's think about that, July 1st, 1941, entering a nation that was still at peace. So here are some photos of these fellows. The one on the left is a group of cadets arriving at the train station down by the river, beginning their walk up the hill towards the, the garrison cantonment area. Uh, here's a fellow reporting in for duty. Um, I can say that uh, these are a little bit fuzzy. I apologize. Uh, I pulled these out of the West Point yearbook, the Howitzer, and uh, I guess they're a little blurry, but then again, I suppose things were a little bit blurry for these gentlemen uh, as well at the time. Uh, you might even say that things were a little hazy at the time. That was a joke. Um, not that there would ever be any kind of hazing going on at West Point. These guys right here are just getting what you might say some constructive criticism. So Beast Barracks, that, that three weeks in their case of cadet basic training, uh, continued. And then the 545 men who had made it through Beast Barracks officially joined the Corps of Cadets as fourth classmen, or as they were known there, plebes. Uh, you'd call them freshmen. And at the time, they were actually the class of 1945, the scheduled to spend four years at West Point before graduation. Now, all told, I think there were about a dozen men in that class, again, of 545 at the time, um, who could claim ties to Alabama. But today's talk is just going to focus on six of them. So let me introduce those gentlemen to you. First, we had Henry Jelks Cabinus Jr. Jelks' father, that name may sound familiar to some of y'all who are attorneys, uh, Jelks' father was an attorney with the law firm, which is today Cabinus Johnson Gardner DeMasso Neal here in Birmingham. And he grew up in Birmingham, um, up on Shades Mountain. But he attended the Swanee Military Academy in Monteagle, Tennessee, and actually entered West Point in the summer of 1940, but he became sick with, uh, with um, bacterial pneumonia, and it was only through the brand new sulfa drug at the time that he was able to survive, but he had to be recycled. So Jelks Cabinus from Birmingham ends up at West Point, once again going through our day on July 1st, 1941. So that's Jelks. Then we have Frank Cash. Frank was actually born in a company town, a mining town in southwestern Virginia called Lignite. It doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, it's an abandoned town, uh, just some chimneys in the Jefferson National Forest, not too far from Roanoke. Uh, his dad was a mining engineer there. And when he came to Birmingham, brought his family with him. Uh, Cash attended Ramsey High School here in Birmingham. And then later, not only attended Birmingham Southern College, but graduated from Birmingham Southern College. Uh, while he was at Birmingham Southern College, he served in the Alabama National Guard and was able to parlay that experience in the Alabama National Guard into an appointment to West Point. So that's Cash. 
Then we had John Moore uh, from Montgomery, Alabama. John's dad was a Army, an Alabama National Guard officer, and he attended and graduated from Sydney Lanier High School down in Montgomery, and then attended the Marion Military Institute in Marion, Alabama. After that, he did a semester at the University of Florida, and then secured an appointment to West Point. Oliver Ollie Patton Jr. And no, uh, this is uh, no relation to the other Patton. Patton's father was a career army officer and he eventually retired in Huntsville, bringing Patton's family to Alabama. Uh, Patton, however, attended the Benedictine Military Academy in Savannah, Georgia, and then uh, the Baylor Military Academy in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and then spent two years at West Virginia University before eventually securing a, an appointment to West Point. And we have this fellow, Jimmy Stewart, not that Jimmy Stewart, our Jimmy Stewart, from Marion, Alabama. Uh, he attended Marion Military Institute and entered West Point in the, uh, actually in the summer of 1940, but he ended up failing mathematics at the December final exams or semester exams. And so he was recycled, turned back, they, they called it, and he showed back up at West Point to try again on July 1st, 1941. That was five of them. And then finally, we have this fellow, Harlan Holden. Uh, his nickname was Speed. And Speed's dad was a career officer in the what was then the Army Air Corps, uh, stationed at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery. And he actually attended Stark University School. So if we were at the archives right now, we would only be about a block or so from where the Stark University School once, once stood. He went to uh, Stark, he enlisted in the, uh, in the Army, and then secured a slot at what was then the West Point Preparatory School in Fort Gordon, Georgia, and ultimately also uh, earned an appointment to West Point. So these gentlemen, these beasts, make it through uh, West Point's first summer beast barracks, and classes start, and in the fall of 1941, life at West Point falls into its usual military and academic rhythm of things. Uh, here are some photos from the howitzer, the yearbook again, of what uh, life might have looked like back then for a cadet. Again, I apologize for things being a little bit fuzzy, but then again, if you have, as in the bottom right corner here, uh, been punched in the head a couple of times during the mandatory plea boxing class and then had to go to a chemistry lab, I, I suspect things would have been fuzzy for you as well. Uh, by the way, you see them up here in the top left corner, uh, taking boards. This was uh, something that you'd probably still recognize at West Point if you went there today. Uh, the, all of the classes would have wall-to-wall, -wall, ceiling to floor, practically uh, blackboards, and the cadets would oftentimes be called upon to take boards and go up and recite to their professor what they had learned, or in the case of me and physics, what they had not learned. But that was West Point at first semester, fall 1941. But that changes, of course, on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. At this point, the Army wasted little time in shortening the course of study at West Point from four years to three years for this particular class. And so their class, which would have been the class of 1945, becomes the class of 1944, destined to graduate in the summer of 1944, rather than in 1945. So in the, at that point, for the next two and a half years, life at West Point continues at an accelerated pace with this four-year course of study crammed in to three years. Now they still had classes. Here's another fellow taking boards. They had football to enjoy. The top left uh, photo shows the staff of the howitzer gathering together. And uh, they even still had time to have dances, or what they called hops, with their dates, which they called drags back then. And here's a shot of some young men with their, with their drags at, the, at, at one of the hops at West Point. There was also, I should add, 
military training, of course. This took place during the summertime. And here you'll see cadets with uh, M2 light tanks with a machine gun with Sherman tanks working on that during their, their summers between the academic years. I'll just add here that it was funny that even while they were doing this and learning to fight a modern armored airborne aerial war, uh, the cadets were still required to take uh, horsemanship, equestrian training uh, at West Point. So this was definitely a time when things were changing for them all. But let's talk about now how our Alabamians were doing during their shortened time at West Point. So we've got, again, Jelks Cabinets up there in the top left corner. Uh, Jelks led a low-key existence. Not a whole lot to say about Jelks while he was there. In fact, the howitzer reported that he was primarily known for his signature phrase, drawled out in his Alabama drawl, I just want a dog. Then you have top right corner, Frank Cash. And remember, Frank, um, also from Birmingham, like, like Jelks Cabinus, was a graduate already of Birmingham Southern College. So he had, uh, and also a time in the National Guard, so he did not have a particularly difficult time at West Point. Uh, the, the howitzer reported him as cruising through the three years, relying on his, quote, Alabama drawl, friendly smile, and quiet efficiency. Now, then you had Patton down in the, the bottom left corner, Oliver Patton. He was the, actually the class's top marksman with the M1 rifle, which you know, sounded very warlike, but he really found uh, his true and greatest pursuits in the literary field. He wrote for the Pointer, which was the cadet newspaper. He worked on the howitzer as an editor on the yearbook. Stewart, bottom right, uh, wrestled, he boxed, he scripted the class, class's uh, 100th night show, and generally earned, they said in the howitzer, the envy of his classmates uh, with frequent visits from young ladies from Marion's Judson College. About a third of the class actually became so-called air cadets, and these gentlemen not only took on all of the academics of West Point, all of the military discipline of West Point, just like these other gentlemen, the other four, um, some of them even played intercollegiate athletics at the time, but they also went through flight school at the same time at nearby Newburgh Army Airfield, about 30 minutes north of, of West Point. And that's what um, Speed Holden and John Moore did. So they opted to become air cadets and actually earn their wings as cadets while at West Point. Ultimately, graduation comes along. And in their case, it was on June 6, 1944. I should point out that one of their classmates was a young fellow named John Eisenhower. And you can see John with his mom in the photo on the left. And you can see John's dad, Dwight Eisenhower, in the photo on the right, talking to paratroopers on D-Day, or the night before D-Day, which occurred on June 6, 1944. So these cadets, coincidentally, which included John Eisenhower, graduated on the same day that we invaded Normandy on the D-Day invasion. And that's why even today they're still referred to as the class of 1944, um, the D-Day class. So for these six gentlemen, these six Alabamians, a month of graduation leave followed. And then Jilk's Cabinus goes to the Field Artillery Officer Basic Course at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. This is probably a good time to share with you, actually, that um, at West Point, you would pick your branch based on order of merit, a combination of class rank, military rank, physical um, fitness skills, uh, other factors, and you would get to pick your rank. And typically, uh, the gentleman that scored higher would go engineers or maybe signal corps, 
some of the more cerebral branches, if you will. Uh, in peacetime, it was this was sort of funny. Peacetime, coast artillery was a very popular branch because you'd be stationed um, on coastal forts in places like California or New York Harbor or Hawaii or the Philippines or even at Fort Morgan. Uh, but with World War II going on, coastal artillery was not particularly popular because everyone wanted to be in the fight and not stationed at Fort Morgan. But like I said, Cabinus uh, chose field artillery. So he was sent to the field artillery basic course at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and um, eventually was assigned to a 105 millimeter howitzer battalion, the 232nd, at Camp Gruber, Oklahoma. And this unit was part of the 42nd Infantry Division, the Rainbow Division. His unit reached Europe in February of 1945 and fought in the Hart Mountains of France's Alsace region. He served as an aerial observer, flying uh, in a Piper Cub, calling in artillery on enemy soldiers, and earned three air medals while he was doing that. Uh, ultimately, he ended the war with his unit uh, in Austria. He stayed, and I'll just jump ahead, he stayed in the Army um, after the war, ultimately retired as a colonel, and passed away in Virginia uh, in 2004. So that was Jelks Cabinus's war from Birmingham, Oklahoma, Germany, Austria, a career in the Army, and then ultimately passing away in 2004. Next, we have Frank Cash. Frank became a cavalry officer, mechanized cavalry at this point. Uh, and so he attended the cavalry officer basic course at Forts, Fort Riley, Kansas, excuse me, Fort Riley, Kansas. He caught up with his unit, the 24th Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron, mechanized in Europe, fought with them in the Hartz Mountains of Germany, and eventually ended up serving with the 4th Constabulary Regiment occupying Germany. I'm sorry, excuse me, occupying Austria. And in fact, he, he shared a villa with his old classmate and fellow Birminghamian, uh, Jelks Cabinus. So Cash uh, ends up there. He ultimately writes, combat duty fine, but occupation duty dull, so submitted my resignation. But he went from there and joined the U.S. Foreign Service in the State Department. He had postings in Germany, in the Philippines, in Turkey. He eventually served as our deputy ambassador to Turkey. He was present in Berlin when the Berlin Wall first went up. He was present in Moscow to assist in the negotiations for the Test Ban Treaty. Had a very, in other words, a very productive career as a Foreign Service officer after he left the Army. And uh, he uh, even taught at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania and at the Virginia Military Institute, and he passed away in 1997. Then we have John Moore from Montgomery. Uh, you'll remember that uh, John's dad was a, a Alabama National Guard officer, and he had gone to Sydney Lanier before going to, to West Point. Well, he was also one of the air cadets that I had mentioned earlier. And John gets his wings with the other air cadets on June 5th, 1944, graduates with the entire class on June 6th, 1944, goes off and does his uh, graduation leave. During his graduation leave, he gets married. You're not allowed to be married while you're a cadet at West Point, so there's typically a huge surge of weddings right after graduation. I mean, sometimes literally an hour after graduation, the first weddings are occurring at the cadet chapel at West Point. Um, what's interesting about John is that he, like so many of the air cadets who are going to be transitioning into fighters, ends up being assigned at Craig Army Airfield in Selma, Alabama. Um, ultimately, he ends up flying a P-38 Lightning, and he made it over to the Philippines and then on to Okinawa uh, for the final days of the war flying in combat missions in his, with his P-38 unit. In his case, it was the 35th Fighter Squadron. He flew again in the Korean War and, in fact, earned a Distinguished Flying Cross, and ultimately served in Germany, at the Pentagon, in North Carolina, and in Vietnam. So here's a fellow that served 
in three wars during his military career. He eventually ended up in Hawaii on the staff of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CETO, and he retired in 1971. But then John, who had served as a combat pilot in three wars, enters seminary, takes holy orders, becomes an Episcopal priest. And he is assigned as an Episcopal priest to be the headmaster of St. John's Episcopal Preparatory School on Guam, where he serves for another 19 years and eventually passed away in 2000. So John goes from Montgomery to West Point to three different wars and eventually ends up as an Episcopal priest. Then we get to Ollie Patton from Huntsville, the son of the retired army officer. Ollie becomes a infantry officer. And so he's sent down to Fort Benning, Georgia for the infantry uh, officer basic course. There he writes, and let me read this to you. West Point taught us things like the calculus. Fort Benning taught us how to stay alive until you could use the calculus. And he also wrote about Fort Benning. It wasn't all bad. Weekends you crossed the Chattahoochee River to wild free Alabama in a roadhouse where you got a big cup of ice and a Coke or ginger ale for 50 cents. What else went into the cup was your choice as long as you kept it in a brown paper bag. So after Fort Benning and after these roadhouses, he ends up joining the 106th Infantry Division, and this is the insignia for the Infantry Division, they were called the Golden Lions, that are at the moment stationed at Camp Atterbury in Indiana. And they are, according to one historian, not only the greenest army unit, ultimately in Europe, but also the youngest, uh, as far as the age of their men were concerned. They reach Europe in the front lines in December of 1944, just days before the Germans attack through the Ardennes in the uh, what becomes known as the Battle of the Bulge. And this battle is just an absolute disaster for the 106th Infantry. They end up, after four days of fighting, having to uh, surrender two full regiments. It's the largest capitulation of a military U.S. military forces in the war since the war began, uh, at Baton, uh, and we lost Bataan. Ollie Patton is wounded, wounded twice, actually, and is taken prisoner, and he spends the next five months of the war in a German POW camp. Uh, as he wrote, again, with his sort of, I think, characteristic humor, it was a short company-grade war for me, after which I was attached to the German Wehrmacht for rations and quarters for the duration of it. So he survived as a POW, um, eventually makes it back to the States, and stays in the Army. Uh, he serves in counterintelligence in Western Europe during the Cold War. He earns a second Purple Heart in Korea during the Korean War, taught English back at West Point, spent two years in Vietnam, and then retired as a Brigadier General in 1974 after, as one of his last assignments, leading the Army Section of the Military Assistance and Advisory Group in Tehran, Iran. At this point, Ali, who you may remember had a, an affinity for the Howitzer yearbook and editing the pointer, uh, is able to devote his life full-time to his real passion, writing, becomes a novelist, a fairly successful one, has a number of books published, and eventually passes away in 2002. And then finally, oh, not finally, excuse me. Then we have uh, fifth, our fifth gentleman is Jimmy Harvey from Marion, Alabama. You know, the guy that did so well with the Judson College ladies. Well, he also serves uh, in the infantry, goes to Fort Benning uh, with Ollie Patton and is then assigned to the 65th Infantry Division, which is at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Also travels overseas with uh, the 65th Infantry Division to France for the, the closing months of the war, um, makes it to the, the German border of uh, France and, and, and Germany in Sauer Larten, overlooking the Saar River. Uh, they slash, when the final offensive begins in March, they slash across the, the Saar River as part of Patton's Third Army, 
uh, moving so fast that they're going having to go ahead and, and steal roadmaps from SO service stations just so they know where they are. They drive on Berlin, they pivot south in order to do so, drive south through Bavaria, make it all the way into Austria, uh, help liberate the, the infamous uh, Malthausen concentration camp in Austria, and finally link up with the Russians on the Danube River. Uh, he ends up leaving the army after the war, becomes a lawyer in Colorado and California, and uh, sadly succumbed to cancer in 1982. Now, finally, we have Speed Holden. Remember Speed, his dad was the Army Air Corps officer stationed at Maxwell Air Force Base. So he, like I said, like with Moore, pins on his wings on June 5th, 1944 at West Point, graduates on June 6th, and then rather going to on graduation leave for that month, he opts to go to what was the Air Force's School of Applied Tactics in Orlando, where his father was the commandant at the time, just to develop more of a understanding of what he was going to be doing and what he was going to be expected to do as a second lieutenant and as a, a pilot and an officer. He then reports for further duty at Craig Army Airfield in Selma and becomes an instructor pilot there for a while. But like so many of the guys in the class, the pilots, they're itching to get overseas. And finally, he gets an assignment for an operational training unit of P-47s. Here's one pictured right here, a P-47 Thunderbolt at, uh, at Abilene, uh, in Abilene, uh, Texas. And he's training with that unit on July 24th, 1945. It's a hot, windy day there in North Texas. He's bringing his, his big, heavy Thunderbolt in for a landing. A burst of wind on that summer day hits him as he's making a sharp tur turn, drives him into the ground. He's killed on impact. This is what his, office, his commanding officer wrote. Speed was the most promising young officer with whom I've ever had contact. His enthusiasm was largely responsible for making this the finest squadron I've ever commanded. He was by far the best student pilot in the outfit. He's buried today at the West Point Cemetery. So we Alabamians are proud, of course, I would like to think we are, of young men like these six young men from Alabama who were part of West Point's class of 1944, men like Speed Holden and the others. But, but what do we take from all of this? I think that's an important question, because if we don't learn something from all of this, then other than perhaps entertainment on a Thursday afternoon at lunch, what's the point? So as I've been preparing for this talk, I've been thinking about that. And I think this might be the answer. Recall that these young men entered West Point in the summer of 1941. It was the most tradition bound school in the country, in a nation at peace. These cadets certainly thought they knew what to expect. At least they thought they knew what to expect. And then Pearl Harbor hits. And then suddenly, now, they're at war. And their time at West Point is crammed into three years rather than four. Graduation leave, often with brand new wives, is shortened to a mere month. They're rushed off into combat with units that weren't even in existence in 1941. In short, none of this was what they had signed up for. And in a way, that sort of sounds like 2020, doesn't it? But in their day, these six young men from Alabama went on, nevertheless, and served and sacrificed and persevered, if not in life, then at least in memory, to serve, I hope, as examples for later generations. So, so perhaps that's the lesson that we take from all of this. You, you can't choose what life is going to give you, but you can choose how you're going to react to it. Just like Jelks Cabinus and Frank Cash, John Moore, Ollie Patton, Jimmy Stewart. 
and Speed Holden. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time. I really have enjoyed doing this. And I think maybe we'll have an opportunity for some questions and maybe even some answers. Yes, thank you so much, Jim, for that amazing presentation. Uh, we do, like Jim said, we have some time for question and answers. So please just post any questions you have into the comment section, either on YouTube or Facebook. I'll come through to us and we'll be able to ask him right now. Uh, so, but I have a couple questions I'd like to start with, and they're also about mostly your, your book, kind of like, I know that this presentation is kind of one part of this book, but I'd love to know more about your research process in it, you know, choosing, how did you choose these men uh, to focus on this presentation, but also in the book, how did you decide to focus on uh, the different men that you focused on? What was the research process for the men who were alive, maybe in the 21st century? Were you able to interview them? Um, kind of some insight into that. Sure, sure. Thanks, Alex. Um, I would say that it had become, and of course, it's very much a challenge now, sadly, finding veterans of World War II with whom you can speak. I, I did have the, I mean, just the flat out honor of getting to talk to a gentleman uh, named Don Carter, who is the, at this point, really the senior surviving graduate of that class who had earned a Purple Heart in, in World War II in the Italian campaign serving with the 10th Mountain Division in Italy. But I did not have a chance to speak with any of the, the men who had all predeceased uh, the book um, when I was writing the book. But and then those men, in that case, they were members of West Point's basketball team, which had attracted my attention because it was a team that had gone five and 10 in 1943 and then with the arrival of a new coach managed to go 15 and 0 in 1944 i think just at a time when we needed those kind of victories to to, to look to and, and, and of which to be proud and in, in that case i just focused naturally on the players the seniors on that team and there were really none of them who were uh, unfortunately had alabama connections um, although one of them trained like like Moore and Holden did at Craig Army Airfield, and another served under a, a Colonel Heron, who um, eventually General Heron, who was from Dadeville, Alabama. But that was really the connection there. As far as the other part of the question, research process, um, boy, you know, we're really fortunate these days to have the digital resources that we have. So I was able to pull from old newspapers, from um, websites that had compiled the operational records of some of the divisions that I detailed these men served in, um, was able to go through the old howitzers. I'll say that if there's anybody here listening from, from West Point or that are, that's just interested in such things, the, um, the, the howitzers are, are digitized and archived at West Point, um, at least up to a certain year um, at, at the, on the Academy's website, on the library website. And it is really cool to go through those things and flip and, and pull stuff out. Alex, did that come close to answering your question? It did, yeah. Okay. And it kind of also, um, we had a question come in. I think you already touched on this, but I don't know if there's any other expansion. Uh, Paul Howell asked, why this class? And, and you mentioned the basketball team maybe being the first uh, thing that attracted you maybe to it, but um, is there any other reasons why you focused specifically on the class of 1944? Yeah, and it's good to hear from Paul. Paul is a fellow graduate and uh, he heads our West Point Society here in, uh, in the Birmingham, Central Alabama area. So, Paul, thanks for joining, man. Um, I just think it's a, it's a, look, the coincidences that are there at this class, a class that joins in 1941 in a nation at peace, and then six months into it, finds out that they are at war, and then has to go through West Point in three years, another two and a half years in their case, and then goes off to war and eventually, you know, 15 of their classmates lose their lives fighting in places from Okinawa to Germany. It, it just, to me, was a very compelling story about a class that um, had a uh, just, a, just a, an incredible historic moment in time. So that's why I picked the class of, of 44. And then as I learned more about it, I came, I, I knew that there was more than just the basketball team. And I became curious about who from Alabama might've been in that class. 
and just found some remarkable stories there. I mean, Oliver Patton and uh, what the 106th Infantry Division experienced during the Battle of the Bulge and afterwards, I mean, could be a story in and of itself. That's what we they really were. I mean, it's, like you said, they encapsulate this moment in time there with their from the fact they come in before it's time at peace, but then by the time they graduate, they're at war. Um, and so I think that that's just it's a very interesting presentation and a very remarkable class, truly. Um, we have, I believe that this is one of my uh, colleagues, but they accidentally uh, put the question in under the archives name. So it says from the archives of history, but I believe I know that this is um, Scotty Kirkland, uh, who said, great talk, Jim. Do you know if or how wartime experiences and conditions informed changes to the curriculum while these young men were going through, uh, oh, this is from Steve Murray. I'm glad he put it in there. Oh, um, thanks, Steve. <laughs> Uh, and from changes to the curriculum while these young men were going through uh, WP, was the Army trying to address evolving leadership needs in real time? Yes, I, th I think very much so. And even though I made the comment earlier about how they were still uh, taking their equestrian horsemanship lessons, um, very they were learning from officers during their military instruction classes during the, the school year. And they were certainly training um, during the summers with tanks, with artillery, with coordination, with, uh, with with air support. And you know, like I mentioned, they were actually this was a, a huge technological leap. You had almost a third of the class taking flying lessons and becoming qualified pilots. So, to West Point's credit, um, even before the war had started, they had realized that a shift was necessary and that uh, the next war was not going to look like World War I and uh, it started applying those lessons. And that was very much, by the way, that was very much the case, I think, Steve, um, when they made it to their officer basic courses in places like Fort Benning or Fort Sill, where they were learning oftentimes from combat veterans who were able to impart real world lessons to them before they went overseas. Excellent. Wait, I'm also noticing that we have um, a comment here, it's a comment less than a, a question, but um, from a relative. Not, uh, Jim, nice job. Thanks very much for taking it on. Dad would have loved it. Ollie Patton, our dad would say, Ollie the Lesser. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know about Ollie the Lesser, but uh, that's high praise. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. I, I've got to say, I get really nervous when I'm doing these talks because I feel like I have a duty to do a good job for the sake of men like your dad. And I, I hope I have done that. I've, I've also got an obligation not to cuss. So I always have a post <laughs> up here on my computer that says no cussing. <laughs> but, but thanks Oliver, your, your dad was a, your, was a remarkable man. And, and like I said, he and the, uh, the other six men of, uh, of his class that were in the 106, as you know, they, they called themselves the seven samurai and they could, no one steal this idea from me, but man, they could be a book in and of themselves. They were remarkable. Elizabeth, we have another question here. This one from Carlotta Sage. Are there any parallels you would draw between the class of 1944 and others in that approximate time and the challenges the military faces now with cyber warfare? Wow. I think probably the low hanging fruit to grab on that question is to think about Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. and the surprise of Pearl Harbor and the state that that put us in after we were hit so unexpectedly and having to react in the way that we did. Um, you know, and it wasn't just Pearl Harbor, it contributed to the loss of the Philippines. It was an absolute disaster. I think that it's quite possible that the next Pearl Harbor we face will not be some kind of surprise attack on Fort Bragg, North Carolina, or the, the, the fleet at, in Norfolk, but rather a cyber attack. And the military is very well aware of that. In fact, at West Point, they do, from what I understand, do war games right now with other academies and other groups of people that 
train for those kind of eventualities. So uh, I, I, th I think that's probably the, the easiest analogy to make and I'll, I'll quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> no, I think that you're 100% you're correct in that. It's, it's definitely kind of a new avenue for uh, young soldiers today that they have to kind of learn to train for. And so that was, a, thank you for a lot of that question. It was a great kind of, a great way to think about where the current kind of education is going with at West Point. Well, it looks like and if anyone doesn't have any more questions, then we might be able to say, uh, call it for right now. But this was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank you so much for uh, your wonderful answers to the, the questions that we had here. And I just want to remind everybody again of Jim's book. And it's available on our online store. And you can read about these men, but also so many other uh, in the remarkable class of 1944. Uh, and thank you so much for everyone who joined us. And I hope to see you again in our next virtual presentation on December 3rd. All right, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Alex. It was an absolute delight. I sure do appreciate it. Tell everybody I said, hey, okay? I will. Thank you. Bye-bye.